Hi, everybody. My name is Fraser Kane, and I am the publisher of Universe Today, and it's time for another virtual star party for February 17th, 2013. We've got uh, five, six telescopes tonight. It's going to be uh, it's going to be a good time. Five telescopes tonight and one PhD astronomer. So uh, we'll kind of move through everyone who's joining us. So for the first time, uh, we've got uh, Andrew Dumbleton, who is in, I don't know if you know where you're, somewhere in the UK. I can tell from the accent, Andrew. Where are you located? Yeah, in the, the Midlands in the UK, so in the centre. And and you are there at a very uh, early in the morning. What time is it there for you? Oh, are you oh, muted? Three o'clock. Yeah, three in the morning. So, so we appreciate your sacrifice. That's uh, that's gets getting up pretty early. And so the great thing about this is Andrew is seeing the future. Andrew is living our June, I guess, or our, uh, you know. Our May, and so he's able to see stuff that we won't see here on the Virtual Star Party normally for for several months, including Saturn, if the skies will actually clear. But we have no guarantee. Uh, so moving on, we got David Dickinson, who's in Florida. Hey, David. Hey, how you doing? Actually, Good. wearing gloves tonight. <clears throat> and and you've got nice clear skies, although it's a little humid, right? It's it's uh well, it's always humid here in Florida. That goes without saying on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. probably about. 30 degrees Fahrenheit, 0 degrees Celsius here right now, so it's cold for us. I thought it was great. You, you mentioned sort of before we got started, you're, you said, you know, I'll try and mute when I run the hair dryer <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to yeah, clear the dew off the that's, telescope. That's my backyard solution to cleaning dew off the telescope is I have a hair dryer <laughs> and extension cord. So about every right. 15 minutes, I just got to blow it out. <laughs> that's great. And, of course, we've got my good friend Gary Ganella, who's in uh, Orange County. Not quite Orange County. Are you not, San Bernardino oh, County. San Bernardino. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought you were in. Uh, I thought you lived right in the middle of Disneyland. No, no, <laughs> no. All right. No, I'd like to, but I don't. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and how's your weather there tonight? Uh, good, good. A little yeah. cool. It's um, yeah. down to forty-eight. I don't. Again, I have no idea what that means. Um, <laughs> that means um, that's about. Eleven or twelve? Nine degrees. Oh, okay. All right. That's yeah. yeah I got the same as here on the wall. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, I'm glad you got clear skies. That's going to be great. Uh, John Kramer is trying to join us. John, can you hear us? No, we'll give him a chance to join us. We'll see what happens. And we've got to Louis Mamakos. Hi, Louis. Fraser. How's Hi. it going? Good evening. And you're, in, uh, you're in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I'm in uh, central Pennsylvania, roughly between you know, Pittsburgh and Harrisburg, not really near much of anything. It's uh, clear, uh, it's very cold, it's about uh, 15 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what, like minus 93 C? That's not sure right, what. yeah. Somewhere, and, around, uh, somewhere around absolute so, zero, I think. Yeah, yeah. and uh, we've got uh, about 25 mile an hour winds uh, gusting, so that's making it a little challenging here with stuff getting blown around. <laughs> right, and so you were saying that, that your telescope can handle that, but the guide scope is battling locked in mortal combat with the wind. Well, yeah, the guider is uh, trying to uh, you know, push the telescope back onto the target when the uh, wind nudges it off. And uh, it's making for some somewhat ugly-looking images that maybe you'll see a bit later. <laughs> so you definitely wouldn't count on doing any really long exposures? No, not this isn't a night for pretty pictures, that's for, that's for certain. Yeah, yeah. And when you've got this moon, which is starting to get bright, too, so... Great, and then joining us for the from the brain side, we've got uh, Dr. Thad Zabo. Hey, Thad. Good evening. All right. Cool. Okay. Well, so that's so now we've had a chance to see what everybody looks like, which is great. I we always forget to like make sure that everyone gets a chance to see because now you'll all disappear and uh, turn into your telescopes, and uh, and we'll get a chance to see the view that everyone's got. And uh, <clears throat> there we go. I can see some uh, some some fan favorites already. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's move. First, let's start with David's view. So, David, you've been uh, you've been getting the moon, and uh, and it's a very special night because there's an there's a an object that appears on the moon on like what one night of the month, and you can just see yeah, it. Yeah, it's within a, fir a few hours of first quarter. We just passed first quarter a few hours ago, and it is what's known as the lunar X. I've got it centered right there. Uh, just came out a few hours ago, right about sunset our time here in Florida. I started tracking and watching the moon. And what's really cool is when it's just beyond the Terminator, those what you're seeing is the edge of two crater rims that are kind of like a confluence right there. And they're actually being lit by the sun just starting to rise there. And the sun will be up for about another two weeks there on that edge of the moon. But it looks cool when the edge, the X is just beyond the Terminator. So the floor of it's in darkness, but the very top of it is just catching the top of the sun. 
<laughs> and so you why? Know, I'm sorry. Ahead. So why can we not see this object for the rest of the month? You you do see it once the moon is uh, illuminate once that area is illuminated, but it's not as prominent because that you don't get the uh, the contrast between the light and the dark. So tomorrow night that area will still be illuminated, but it won't look like an X anymore because the floor of those craters will start to become illuminated and it will just light up that whole region. Right. So any other time of the month, it just likes oh, there's you know two craters that are adjacent to each other. But as of right now, those those walls are high enough; they stand up off of the the surface of the moon far enough that you get these deep shadows in them, and it gives this X effect. So yeah, <sighs> that's great. And so we were talking about yeah, <laughs> Nicola has her flocculent spirals, but we got the lunar X. <laughs> um, uh, now, but. And so we were kind of thinking before we started the broadcast that we should be on the search for a, a whole alphabet of uh, of objects on the moon. And in fact, there's uh, you can do that with galaxies. If anyone's uh, seen this, the folks at the Galaxy Zoo dug up uh, galaxies that look like each one of the letters of the alphabet and the numbers. And so you can write out any word in galaxies thanks to uh, thanks to that. So it'd be nice for maybe we could dig up some uh, some features on the moon. That we could uh, we could relate and we could write things. So we've got X covered. I don't know. O is really easy. <laughs> and O, we got no X and O. Yeah, you, you, you can play tic tac toe game. on the moon. Yeah, you can play game with tic tac toe. So, and I guess that's one thing. I mean, like with moon mappers with CosmoQuest, you're generally getting much um, higher angle illumination. So finding letters might not be the best thing going through the you know thousands and thousands of images there. But there's enough amateur images at all of the different phases of the moon that eh, it might make a project for some people if they have the time to go dig through a bunch of, of lunar images to come up with our alphabet here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like I said, O and X and maybe a Y, but yeah. Right. Well, there might be a Q, a Q on there. Yeah, I see yeah. a Q there right now. We yeah. were talking yeah. about that. There is a Q in one of the craters. Um, oh, so Sharon, uh, one of our astronomers, actually, is, is wondering, how do we calculate the exact time for the lunar X? So, so how do you find out when the lunar X is going to be visible? Yeah. Generally, a few hours after first quarter is a good bet. Um, there is, I've seen a few web pages out there. I was keeping track of that last year. I haven't published a table this year yet on, on AstroGuys as far as when it's going to become visible. Each illumination of the moon, incidentally, because of libration, isn't exactly the same. A lot of areas that are prominent during one libration, you may not see the same illumination angle on, on the next first quarter phase, so it may not be as prominent. Uh, I would love to see an article on Universe Today about the Lunar X, hint, hint. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you'd be so kind. I took, I took some photos earlier tonight. Yeah? Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, put that together. That would be... We, I approve it already. Done. <laughs> cool. uh, I'll clear with Nancy, but, uh, you know, I'm sure she'll be fine with it. Uh, but that's but that's great. And so, I mean, the moon right now is 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 a quarter moon. I mean, it's literally, you know, halfway... It's it's half lit, half in shadow right now, and so it's it's probably the one of the best times to look at the moon. That almost confuses people too. It's it's actually it's half illuminated, but it's first quarter. I always tell people it's one quarter of illumination. So when you're talking quarter, it's kind of misleading that you're seeing fifty percent of the moon. Just right, so. you're seeing 50% of the side that's always turned toward us. So yeah. you know, it's as if the, the light is coming from this direction, so this this half that's facing the sun is always lit up, but then you only see half of a half in this, yeah. this first quarter. So There you go. So there's, you know, always happy to push phases of the moon. <laughs> <laughs> there's the view. So... Um, and that shows libration on phases of the moon, too. I downloaded yeah. that. That's, yeah, we have that's that. kind yeah. of cool. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. All right, well, I'm going to move on, but we're going to come back. Now, you, you were saying that you're going to try and jump between the moon and Jupiter, right? Yeah, I, Jupiter's only about six degrees from the moon right now, so I can slide over there about halfway through. Okay, sure. Yeah, that would be great. And if the clouds are in any way um, uh, giving us a hard time, let me know. But No, we're clear. Okay, great, great. And I know... So here's Andrew's view. I'm just moving over to Andrew's view just because he's got, you know, as I said, he's, he's several hours ahead of us, and so he's actually got Saturn in the sky, but unfortunately it's perfectly cloudy right now. So, so Andrew, you, you let me know if, if we see Saturn. We'll do. It's solid at the moment. Is it totally solid? Oh, no. Yeah. <clears throat> but just before you joined us, you, you were getting a little bit, and now it's just completely uh, clouded out. So. That's right. uh, 
All right. Well, we'll we'll come back to you. Um, well, Gary, I uh, I think we know what this is. Uh yeah, yeah. You better know what that one is by now. <laughs> the rosette. Uh, yeah. And so, how how long of an exposure was this for the rosette uh, nebula? Two minutes, and it's been four by four. So I'm taking um, what was would that be about uh, seven fifty by six hundred pixels is the size of the image. A little more um, than that, about eight. Oh, uh, so just I got a question on YouTube, and that reminds me um, that we'd be glad to take questions, uh, any comments, questions, feedback, requests that you might want to make, any objects you want to see. We'll try to to fulfill your your demands. Um, uh, so there's a few places you can do that. If you're watching this on Google+, Plus, you can make a post. If you're watching it, say, on, on my stream. Uh, if you're watching this from the event page, you can post it into there. If you're watching this somewhere on the Internet embedded, you can always use Twitter with the hashtag uh, Star Party, or you can uh, you can make a comment on YouTube. And I will say that the, the YouTube is sort of the most stable place, so we're most likely to see it on, on YouTube if you make a comment there. So you can always, wherever you're watching it, it's all just the same thing. You can just click to watch it on YouTube, and then you can make your comment there. So Now we got one question. I think this is a great one for Thad. Um, this comes from BTL743. I have a question. When astronomers discover an asteroid, how do they find it again when they go home and come back the next day? It's going so fast. Ah, okay, so <clears throat> typically if, if you've discovered it, you've you've had to have taken more than one photograph to say it's a discovery. If you take one shot and there's an asteroid in there, you have no idea if it's an asteroid, a star, you don't know what it is. The idea is on any one night you take multiple shots and then hopefully within the same frame somewhere you can see by doing a blink comparison. So you show one image, you show another image, and, and you go back and forth between them, all the stars will sit in the same place, but the asteroid will hop back and forth. And so from that, you get some idea of how much it's moving each night. You can get some idea of brightness change, and this lets you predict a track, and so that way, if you come back two days, three days later, you have a pretty good idea of where to aim the scope, take a couple of images, and look for the thing that's moving again by a blink comparison. So, yeah, it's not... Uh, it, it can be a little tricky, right? I mean, you, you yeah. do need to get at least a couple images on to, to do the uh, the blank comparison. I mean, this was one of the things with the discovery of, of Pluto, for example. Pluto had to be um, discovered essentially by blink comparison, and that was from images taken uh, more than a few nights apart. I think for the Pluto discovery, they were like six nights apart or something um, because it's so far away from the sun and moves so slowly that it's uh, it's a real trick to pick that out, especially back then, Clyde Tombaugh with photographic plates and not even nice image processing software like we have now where it can even be designed to pick out things that change position from one photo to another. So, yeah, good question. Definitely a good yeah. question. Yeah. The, uh, the anniversary of Pluto's discovery is tomorrow. Okay. Oh, really? Right, 29? Yeah. So... 1930. 1930, so it's... Yeah. Trying to do some math here, yeah, <laughs> seventy something years, but that's great. It's that's it's amazing to think that uh, that in that time period, just all the things that have happened, and yet you know that we've that we've discovered Pluto, you know, only what there. Thanks, Gary, eighty three years ago, yeah, and now you years. know. And its yeah. orbit is 248 years, so 83 years. It's gone one third of the way around its orbit since it was discovered. Just one third. And ne well, didn't Neptune has only gone like one full orbit now since its yes. discovery? Yes, Neptune yeah. completed one full orbit. I believe it was 2011. So. Yeah. 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 It's it's They're quite surprising up. to think. Yeah. When you think about how long humans have been looking in the sky and seeing all these objects, I mean, they, they could see all the visible planets, Mercury and Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, but the other ones, a lot of the other objects, really have only been discovered fairly recently in, when you consider all of human history. Uh, I'm going to move to John's view here. John, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm with you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, great. That's, that's great. I, that's a nice view of the moon there. Are you able to get the Lunar X with your view? Yeah. Um, it's going to be a smaller scale. Yeah, I can see I'll you've got a much more. sort of a wider field of view than, uh, than David does. Let's oh. see. So there we were looking up like more by the lunar Apennines at the kind of northern end of the Terminator. So now we're sliding farther south where some of these larger craters are. So let's see. Is that the X? Is that it right there? 
there's so many. The, the thing is, when you get to that south part of the moon, right around first quarter in the terminator, there's so many craters. You're close you're not, to it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nearby if that's not in the frame. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. Yeah. Is that it? Would that... Well, I'm thinking it's further over to the left there. I guess in your All case right. it would be right, but... <clears throat> hmm. Now, what's the uh, the camera that you're using for this? This is a, a monochrome imaging source USB camera. Yeah, I always really like the images that come out of your uh, out of your setup. Looks great. This is a great time of the the month for imaging the moon too. We really get some of these these enormous craters in in shadow. Tycho or Tycho is tends to be just coming out of shadow now. Clavius, Copernicus. Um, Oh, look, so, just stop there, John, Look and look at that mm -hmm. that crater there with the uh, central peak there. You can see that little shadow, and you can see the shadow of the of the central peak, the mountain that's, that's, uh, that's right in the middle of that crater. And so this gives us an idea of something Galileo did. Was able to, he was able to figure out the height of mountains on the moons by, by uh, examining the length of the shadows of the craters at the, the different um, angles of sunlight hitting it. So this really, you know, fully three-dimensional world definitely becomes strongly apparent when uh, the, the sun is very low in the, the sky from wherever on the moon we're, we happen to be looking. So <clears throat> so you're just able to use some trigonometry to figure out how big those, those, uh, those mountains are. Yeah, yeah, that's essentially it. So. Looks like the Tico monolith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> from 2001. You can imagine the, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic! Of course, that mountain there—I mean, it's—it's it's got to be at least a kilometer or more high to be able to to cast that kind of shadow. So now, what causes one of those mountains to pop up in the middle of those craters? It—it's a rebound effect. When you have one of these meteorites come in and not blow up in the air like the one over Chelyabinsk. Well, first of all, there's no air in the, on the moon, so you don't have to worry about that. But it causes such an impact when you watch a, a slow motion video of this that the surface buckles under it and then rebounds back up. And so you have material that comes back up in the center of the crater. And if it's a large enough impact, that'll stick around as a mountain for you know, millions, billions of years after the crater actually happened. So it's like, I mean, I've seen like, even like water drops, if you hit like water drops, yes. you can see when the water hits the, you know, when the drops hit the water, then you get this splash up of the water coming back up. And, but if it's, you know, it's just dirt and molten rock, then it just piles back down as it comes and doesn't actually spread out flat. It just mounds up in the middle of the crater. That's it. When you have material like this, it'll harden. I mean, you can even do this with, with sand. If you get sand and you, you start throwing objects into it that are, are large enough, you throw them fast enough, that you, you do a slow motion video of it and you can watch that extra peak kind of form out of the middle and then it'll still be left there. But yeah, again, if you do it with this igneous rock like the uh, the moon is made of, when it hardens again, yeah, you, you have a, a mountain left behind. So... Fantastic. Well, I'm going to move to Lewis's view. Uh, Lewis, what have we got here? Hey, it's the it's it's our uh, it's our icon for the virtual star party. <laughs> uh, this is M51 um, that I, I took um, at the beginning of the star party. This is about a 10 minute uh, stack of, of images, and there's a bunch of interesting things to see here. There's I'm not sure. Can you see my mouse? Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are not meteors. This is an airplane that uh, helpfully flew through one of my images. Um, it's also pretty common for satellites to go zigging through the image uh, as well. I didn't pick it up on this one. There's another little tiny small galaxy down here mm -hmm. that sort of barely shows up. Yeah. I went and decided to revisit this image because uh, a couple years ago there was a supernova in M51 uh, that I imaged, and I was kind of curious to see if it was still there or not, and it turns out it's not <laughs> anymore. Um, I can bring up that other image, well, and uh, we can do kind of a now you see it, now you don't comparison. Now, with your airplane image, I mean, that's got to be like the, the the lights on the ends of the wing, right? They're perfectly in parallel. Yeah, that's right. Um, and occasionally, uh, depending on sort of what angle I see the, the aircraft, and if it's a bit further away and takes longer to transit, you can actually see the blinking um, go on with little 
uh, modulations in the brightness as the uh, airplane crosses the field. Um, and and I guess have you got any inf interesting information about M fifty one for us? That I mean, that's a pretty fantastic galaxy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a spiral. It's fairly nearby at only about twenty five million light years off. So this is, it's not quite as close as like M eighty one or M eighty two, and not nearly as close as like Andromeda. But this is still pretty local as far as galaxies go, and because it's close by, you can see a lot of structure in it. This is one of your classic grand design spirals, but it's got this little friend that's visiting there, on the uh, the top of the the field of view there, and as that's passing by, it's drawing some of the, the gas and dust and stars out of M51. And so you can see that one spiral arm that's kind of elongated and connecting to that other galaxy. Also, if you look closely at the, the shape of the dust, it makes like a, a letter E, except the letter E is oriented this way, coming off the uh, the top of that little uh, neighboring yeah. galaxy that's, that's going by there. It's so, like a fork on the top of the... Yeah, uh, it's kind of like, okay, so it's... You know, if this was true galactic cannibalism, maybe that's the fork that's eating the other galaxy. But, <laughs> so. Right. And what's causing that, that shape? That's a good question. Uh, yeah. I mean, you get different pressures the, the, uh, due to essentially tidal effects as these galaxies pass by each other. Um, you know, there's also looking at what the <clears throat> inter galactic medium is like in that region, although it's usually so low density that it, it shouldn't really matter too much. Um, could matter where the gas and dust was in the, the smaller galaxy as it flew past. And, um, you know, that, that can determine some of the shape of this. But the thing is, when, when we're looking at this, the, the scale can be kind of hard to imagine. The, 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 uh, the Whirlpool galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. And so when you're looking at that shape of that E there off to the side, I mean, that, that E is about, you know, 30,000 light years from, from top to bottom and probably about 20,000 light years out to each end of the, the letter. So that's, that's not like trying to look for letters on the moon where they would only be maybe a few uh, yeah. tens of kilometers or maybe a few hundreds of kilometers across. So much, much, much bigger structure. And so, Lewis, it looks like you've switched your images now. This is like, I'm assuming this is two years ago in the past, right? Yeah, that's right. This is the, uh, the image I took um, uh, perhaps a day or two after the supernova discovery was announced. And I ran out, and amazingly enough, the skies were not completely clouded over, so I was able to get a picture of the supernova. And it looks like a star, but um, it's not a foreground star. It's the supernova in that galaxy. I always, you know, I, it's always amazing to me, like, just how how well people have to know their galaxies to be able to find these supernovae. And I know there's a lot of amateurs actually discover these supernovae. There's a lot of people out there who who will visually observe galaxies every night, and they'll just move their telescope from object to object, and they know the 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 galaxy so well that they know when there's a bright object in one of these galaxies that, that shouldn't necessarily be there, and then they can tell that, that there might be a supernova. And so you can see, like if you look in this image of Lewis's, there's probably five or six bright stars that are actually in front of the galaxy. And then there's this additional one that's actually in the arm of the galaxy. And so you as an amateur astronomer would have to have memorized the uh, this galaxy and know, oh, no, there should be only five bright stars in this galaxy not that sixth one that just appeared. Yeah, and I can swap over to the uh, to that picture I just took and show you that same spot. Um, I actually imaged this galaxy it was within 24 hours of when the supernova showed up. I was just in the wrong part of the world. I think it was within 18 hours was when the discovery was made. So I, I had to... You know, oh, shot great. it in one week, and then came back the next week and shot it again. And so this gives a fairly nice comparison of where exactly it, it shows up in there. This is you yeah. know, it's kind of getting started with astrophotography, so it's not the the best pair of images. But I mean, it definitely um, shows the difference between no supernova and wow, this light took 25 million years to get here, and within one week, it wasn't there this one week. There it is the the next week. So. Hey. Look at this. Look what I see appearing in Andrew's view. Come on, Andrew. That'll it's be our first there. that'll be our first Saturn sighting of the season if we can get it. Oh. Go away clouds. Go, Go away. away. Go All right, away. we'll come back. We'll come back to that. How does it look in your sky, Andrew? 
It, it's still very cloudy, but uh, the, there's the occasional hole that sort of drifts across, and that, would, believe it or not, is seeing through the cloud because it was a, a minute integration. Um, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. But, All right. Uh, not looking good. All right. This we can use our weather machine if we need to. <laughs> this is probably similar to the view that Galileo would have had through his, his one-inch scope. So I'm going, why does that thing have ears? <laughs> yeah, so, totally has ears. Um, but but so again, I, yeah, this is seeing through a cloud. And I've had this happen a lot of times when I've done astronomy. It's like, why is my picture suddenly fading out? And I go look up at the sky, and I can't see it at all anymore. <laughs> right. It's completely clouded out. But the larger aperture of the scope, you can still see it in the scope. Uh, so, question from BTL743. Can I, Fraser? Can you explain that time lapse mode that you found in your T3i? So, uh, if anyone is is wondering, so I've got a Canon T3i camera, and um, and there's a piece of software you can install on the camera called Magic Lantern, and that allows you to actually. It, it gives you a ton of extra functionality, including uh, it has its own uh, intervalometer. You know, built right into the software, so it's so it's kind of like it's like you kind of hack the BIOS of the of the camera, but it's temporary. So you can, as soon as you take out your your card, then it goes back to uh, being the normal uh, software on the camera. So it's great. So you can you can put it in, you get all this extra functionality and a lot of really fine tuned control over the camera, and then you pull it out and it goes back to the normal Canon software. So it's it's great, and it <clears throat> and then you don't need an, a, a separate device to do a time lapse. And so I was doing a time lapse of the of the moon last night, and you just point the camera at the sky, turn on the the time lapse functionality on the camera, and then the camera just just goes and takes pictures and just drops them on its memory card. So it's called Magic Lantern. And so if you've got any kind of Canon, uh, you can install that software, and it's pretty great. So is that part of the CHDK, or is that a separate um, product? More, I guess not not the hackers developers kit at this point, but something that is more commercially developed now. Or I'm not sure. No, it's still a, a hacker. It's still a hackers kind of open source thing. Okay. Yeah. Wow, look at this view of the moon. All right, so we're right on the edge of one of the Maria here. Let's see. Is that... I was just cruising around. You want me to go back? I think that was where uh, MSEA, M, and... Or no, MSEA, no go, go wherever you want. Follow your instincts. I'm not going to... I'm, I'm just going to come along for the ride. There you go. I was just cruising around, enjoying the view myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna go back to Gary's view now because what is that? Is that Thor's helmet, Gary? That is Thor's helmet, and I'm gonna leave that for a minute. I've got a failure in the scope. It is uh, not tracking all of a sudden. Uh oh. oh no. So I will um, get back in here as soon as I can, but I gotta sure. go out and try recalibrating it. But that's sure. Thor's helmet, and Thad can tell you about it. <laughs> Thad. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, Thor's helmet. This is a, an emission nebula, and again, Harry, Harry, Harry. I said Gary, and I was going to H Alpha, and so my brain it took the H Alpha and put the one in front of Gary and turned his name into Harry for a second there. So, but Gary is, is shooting through an H Alpha filter. So this is looking in particular at the hydrogen. So very hot star nearby, and all of the extra ultraviolet radiation from that star is causing the electrons to change level in the, the hydrogen there, and as the electrons drop down in energy level, they give off this characteristic light. If you could see it with your eyes, it would be red, and the shape here kind of looks like, like Thor's helmet. Yeah. It's, it's invading through, uh, you know, south of Orion here as it's coming in, so... Vikings in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move to David's view. So there's Jupiter. Oh, yeah. and I can see Andrew just lost uh, Saturn again. <laughs> oh, yeah, wait. Let's move back over to Jupiter. Oh, there it is. Hold on. I'm going to go over to Saturn. Okay. Oh, no. There it is. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to tease us all night yeah, long. Yeah, it is. It is. All right. I'm going to... But it, when I see the small version, it looks like not bad. And then as I move over, I can see it's still actually pretty, pretty clouded out. So great view of Jupiter, though. And let me guess, no red spot. No, it was out about uh, an hour before we started. It just rotated behind the limb. <laughs> you, you know, I did some rough calculations earlier today when I was looking to see if it was going to be visible. We're not quite in sync with it. It's, uh, we gain about 20 degrees of longitude for Jupiter's rotation every week. So in a week or two, probably next week, we might catch it. Okay. <laughs> All right. It, it, it looks kind of brownish today. It, didn't really, it, doesn't, it doesn't look as red as people really think. It looks kind of 
salmon to teal colored, really. <laughs> yeah. There. Saturn. Nope. Come on back. Here, Come planet, back. planet, planet. It's thinning a bit, I think, guys. It's thinning, so uh, yeah. maybe. But that's still pretty yep. cloudy if you see yep. what I can see. It's, it's uh, a brighter image. Yeah. Yeah. What's yeah. your telescope, Andrew? It's uh, uh, a Mead LX200, uh, so it's an 8 inch uh, Smith category. But it's also, you're running a really nice camera, so I think it'd be great to explain that. You've got a color Malin cam, right? That's right, yes. Yeah. So it's uh, an enhanced uh, security camera uh, that can take really long exposures with a, a really sensitive chip. Uh, so normally it would take um, a matter of a couple of seconds to, to get a good view of Saturn. But uh, say tonight, because we're shooting through cloud, it's, it's taking about a minute, uh, which is also why it's very, very blurred. Um, so now, have, have you, you imagine the blurring that takes case yeah. over a web webcam? Uh, we're capturing yeah. a minute of blurring, unfortunately. Now, now, have you worked with a Malin cam at all, Thad? Um, I haven't, but um, I've gone out to. It's called uh, Southern California Desert Video Astronomers, and so what they'll do is they, uh, the guys out there, they have a couple of twelve foot by eight foot screens, mm -hmm. and they'll plug Malin cams into the back of. I guess it's a couple of eleven inch. Uh, Schmidt Cassegrain scopes, and then just project the the view from the Malin cam up out, out onto these uh, these large screens out there in the desert. So kind of um, less of a virtual star party and more of a you know live and and in your face. Here's you know what we're looking at with the telescopes right now. Yeah. So yeah, it was um you know I, I need to I need to talk to them a little bit more about their their setup. They really put on a terrific show out there. So. It's a it's a really wonderful camera, and I you know I'm really glad to be able to actually have one in the in the star party tonight. So I think that'll be great. Yeah. Um, now we got a question from uh, Bill Napper on uh, on the meteorite on the Russian meteorite, and I think you know just to be to be clear, we did a whole show on Friday for the virtual for the um, for the weekly space hangout, only talking about the the Russian meteorite and the uh, close pass of 2012 DA14. Uh, which happened on the same day, but uh, or within 24 hours of each other. So, uh, and I guess uh, Bill wants to know um, uh, I guess whether it actually blew up or yeah, did it, it blow just... up? Yeah. So, what what was the uh, did it actually blow up or was it you know what caused the shock wave? So, I mean, it's it's essentially always uh, a sonic boom, but there there would have been a, a detonation also. You have something that's entering the atmosphere at 33,000 miles an hour. And so that has to slow down to less than 700 miles an hour, the, the speed of sound, just due to uh, the interaction with Earth's atmosphere. So you get this incredible amount of compression of the air on the front side of this meteor, and that, that pressure is enough to shatter it, um, but a lot of the, yeah, I, I guess I, I need to look at an analysis of where most of the energy came from, that one boom that knocked the doors off of the, the one factory and blasted out windows over so much of Chelyabinsk and the, the surrounding areas. Um, yeah, I guess I, I guess I need to look up exactly whether that is um, just a massive sonic boom from a from a much larger and less aerodynamic less aerodynamic object than say a, a fighter jet or something else that might go uh, faster than the speed of sound, or if it is actually the pressure causing the the uh, the incoming meteorite to to fracture violently um, on its on its way in. I mean, the thing is, we haven't seen the kind of seismic signature that you get from the thing hitting the ground. So it definitely blew up. Uh, but I guess the question is whether that's what caused the the sonic wave that knocked out all the windows that uh, I, in that area. I, I wonder if any sky surveys might have saw that before it came in a night or two before and not realized they got an image of it yet. Well, the current size of it now, they're thinking, is it's about 7,000 tons, and it was about... 17 meters is the last one I 17, saw. Seventeen, yeah, about 50 feet across, right? 17 meters. So that's enormous. So <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's a much bigger object than I think we were originally thinking. And the last energy estimate I saw was 500 kilotons. If you consider the atomic bombs that were used during World War II, those were about 20 kilotons. 
So the fact that this took such a low and shallow angle into the Earth's atmosphere was a very, very good thing for um, the people that it affected. If it had come in at a steeper angle, we could have a planet that's missing a few hundred thousand people wow. now compared to before yeah. it hit. <clears throat> there's, so. a, there's a really interesting simulation that I saw at the American Astronomical Society a couple of years ago where they, they modeled what the Tunguska impact looked like and exactly how it kind of doesn't matter how shallow the object comes in because when it detonates, the energy goes down through the atmosphere and it just in this almost like a column of energy that comes straight down and you know even they all air burst but then it's just that explosion that comes that comes down i think you know it's the height that it detonated the size of it i think as you said you know people got really lucky if it was a lot bigger it would have definitely taken out cities and stuff bigger or or steeper or steeper angle i mean the, yeah. the angle does have a an effect here if if it comes in very directly then you're not dissipating as much energy as it comes into the atmosphere it's got to in, dissipate that energy over a much shorter path length and so you're talking about the equivalent of 500 kilotons of uh, tnt in this explosion or in the the total amount of energy dissipated if that's coming in from a more direct angle, then that's getting dissipated over a much smaller area of the Earth. If it comes in low and shallow like this, I mean, you can see the heat of the air being compressed in front of it, um, the energy being being taken out from it, being slowed down from uh, the atmosphere like this, and you can stretch that out over a, a much larger pathway. Now, the, the final um, detonation, and I'm, I'm going to go with that word again. I know we said we, we weren't exactly sure if, uh, if that was it. <laughs> yeah. Um, if that had occurred only a kilometer above the ground instead of more than 20 kilometers above the ground, Charlie Bensk wouldn't exist right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I moved to Lu to Lewis's view, and I think, Lewis, you're showing us another supernova that you've observed? Yeah, this is from uh, about a year ago. This is um, uh, M95 and supernova SN2012AW. And the image on the left is the one that was taken um, not quite a year ago, I think in May, um, shortly after the supernova discovery. And then the one on the right um, is, I just took this evening, um, the spiky stars aren't uh, lots of little Thor's helmets. They're <laughs> the, the This is your battle the, with the wind. Yes, this is the wind bouncing my telescope around. But I think in this case, and then perhaps Thad can, uh, can chime in here, but I think I actually see uh, somewhat dimmer supernova in the same spot um, as my image almost a year ago. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the, the thing is, this there's a time scale that goes with how long an explosion is visible, and it deals with the size of the object that caused the explosion. So, for instance, if you look at a, let's say, a, a neutron star, and you dump a whole bunch of stuff onto the neutron star, and it undergoes fusion, the time scale for it to brighten and fade out is a matter of seconds because a neutron star is only a few um, tens of kilometers across maybe. If you look at a nova, right, where you take a white dwarf, so something about the size of the Earth, and you pile a bunch of stuff on it, and that undergoes fusion, not enough to blow the whole thing up like in a supernova, but just as a nova, that tends to brighten over a day or so and then fade out over a couple of weeks. When you're talking about something the size of a supernova, if this was a supergiant star to begin with, that means it was a star wh whose outer layers would have been out at about where the orbit of Jupiter is compared to our sun, or bigger. And so with this explosion, it brightens over a span of say two weeks typically um, and stays bright for about or brighter for about a year or more uh, after the initial supernova shockwave rips the thing to pieces so yes it is possible that that is still the remnant of that supernova still fading out even um, a year after it became visible and yeah I remember imaging this one last March so it is just just under a year I think since it was first discovered the the structure of this galaxy is really interesting too. Yeah, it's a barred spiral, um, but it looks like the spiral arms even kind of come together and meet and form almost a ring. Yeah. So you, so you have you know the bar, and then you kind of have this ring structure outside of this, and then you have an additional um, structure of, of of it looks like spiral arms uh, outside of that that form kind of a bigger oval around the the ring. Yeah, this is this is a real pretty one. That's a you know terrific 
shot there on the left. Hopefully you can get some stability with uh, tracking tonight and, and can produce it again. Uh, but yeah, but that, that one on the left is really, really gorgeous. Well, so. Do you know what the Galaxy is, Lewis? It, it's M9, M95. Yeah, M95, it's kind of in the center of Leo. This is the perfect time of year to shoot it. It's, it's up all night tonight. It mm -hmm. rises right around, uh, uh, around sunset. So, um, you know, we're entering the time of year which is terrific for galaxies. So, yeah, we're we're entering the time which is when people can actually start doing their uh, Messier marathons too, within about a month or so, right? Yes. So it's typically um, probably the the new moon that would come on March 9th might would be my guess for. Um, Messier marathons this year, although it's going to make some of the objects in Aquarius a little bit tricky, I'd imagine, like mm -hmm. M2. Um, but yeah, that would be the new moon to try it this year. So it's it's if you look at the list of 110 objects that Messier observed and recorded, um, you know, not all during his lifetime. There were some added that were just extracted from his notes later. It turns out there's a slight break in them right around the middle of March to the beginning of April, that if you start observing at sunset and go through dawn the next morning and you move quickly enough, you can get all 110 in, in one night. So. Or if we, you know, many hands make light work. Or you even better. A, you get a bunch of astronomers helping out at the same time. Um, Let's parallelize this, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, so Andrew, we're, we're going to uh, deputize you and get your help with a messy marathon. Uh, <laughs> So David is uh, is showing us the moons here. Which which moons have we got, David? I believe that's Io and Europa. I'm not certain. I know there's three on one side. I looked earlier tonight at the orientation. There's three on one side and one on the other side currently. You can see how bad my seeing is right now because I had to really overexpose it in order to get those two in there. Yeah. So so is it is it the dew? Do you need to run the hair dryer? What's going on? I just on? did. I just oh, you did. did. It's, probably, it's probably fogging back up again, but yeah, yeah that's where it's oversaturating, that's a lot of it's just like ice crystals and stuff on the front. That's uh. Well, I just remember too, uh, the moon is going to occult Jupiter in about ten hours or so. Not from here, from uh, southern Australia and Tasmania, they're going to see it. We won't see it here. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the, that's the part with the occultations with Jupiter and the Moon. Most of the time, you have to be in a certain part of the planet to be able to get a view of it. Yeah, this is the because, last one for 2013. We've we've had a cycle of three, and each lunation has been the Moon's been passing in front, but next lunation is going to miss. It's going to occult Vista too, I believe. Asteroid Vista. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Oh, Saturn. Oh no, no. Yeah, I wonder if uh, if Teal or uh, Paul Stewart or any of our um, yeah. other astronomers who are who are in uh, New Zealand or Australia are in the the right place to catch this occultation. It's a it's terrific. We we were able to view it um, last year uh, with Ahmet. He he got a view of it from Turkey and uh, and it was just terrific to see. There's the moon and there's Jupiter and then it just disappears behind the moon and then. Half an hour later or so, it, it reappears on the other side of the limb. It was just great. This uh, the moon doesn't occult Jupiter again until 2016, so huh. it's going to be the last one for Jupiter. We're going to have one of Venus, uh, I think, in August of this year. Is the next planet getting occulted? And there's many, many occultations of Spica, Spica, Spica. Mm -hmm. Will you ever get these situations where a a big chunk of the planet can actually get a chance to see it? Usually it's a pretty good size. It, it, it depends. Um, the the main stars that can be occulted by the moon are uh, Antares, Aldebaran, Spica, and... Regulus. Oh, Regulus, yeah. It's very close to the ecliptic. Yep. Yeah. And the Pleiades. The Pleiades often have um, the moon move through them, and so you can can get them kind of disappearing one at a time or reappearing one at a time wow. as the moon moves yeah. through the field of view of the planet. That would be great. That would be really neat to see. But I guess it's hard because you can't do the, like a long exposure on the Pleiades to see the, the stars at the same time that you're getting this really bright moon that's going to wipe them out. So. Well, you can get the stars, but no, not the nebulosity. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the stars would be easily visible, but the, the nebulosity is... Uh, would be another matter. Now I wonder if you could ever get an occultation of like an, a waning or waning crescent or waxing crescent moon with the Pleiades, and you could get some Earth light. And yeah, I, th I think I've seen it. When, yeah. when it goes in on the dark limb of the moon, that's usually when it's more dramatic for those fainter objects. Mm. The the bright limb of the moon swamps them out. Right. 
Oh, uh, Lewis, so as you're, I don't see the wind pushing your telescope around, Lewis. Oh, I can see the wind at the bottom there. Yeah, on your. Uh, My anti head injury uh, flag. Yeah, yes. on your on your flare. <laughs> Yeah, those counterweights, oof, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's not fun. No. How's how's your telescope doing, Gary? Uh, I got a failure. Something in the right ascension gear. Either there's something in there that's hitting. Yeah. So I'm gonna jump out of here and pull it apart. All right, all right. Well, have fun. It. I hope it's uh, I hope it's as easy to fix as Stewart's was. Yeah. Boy, all of a sudden Hopefully. it just uh, it's not moving the way it should. So we'll see. We'll keep yeah. Thank you guys for you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll see everybody later. All right. Thanks, Gary. Good night, right, Gary. Bye. See you, Gary. I'm gonna. I've gone back to uh, to John's view here. Now, what? Look at that. It looks like there's like a crease on the moon. I don't know if you can see that. That there's like yeah. this long, almost indentation. I'm not sure if that's the the straight wall or if that's one of the the scarps. So you you have that's, a. Go ahead. That's the Valley Alps. The Valley Alps Valley there. Okay, so this is um, so this is part of the Apennines. Or, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So towards the the northern edge of the moon. Okay. I'm, okay. I think I know where I am now. I think we're looking between Mare Frigoris on the far uh, right, and then starting to get the top of Mare Imbrium uh, below that. And so you know you see this this mountain range in there, and so this is. It's a valley. I mean, it's kind of interesting to think about this. I mean, when you see valleys on Mars, we have a pretty good idea that they're caused by erosion at this point. We, we understand that Mars was wet. The moon has never been wet. right? The moon has never had a substantial atmosphere or anything to do this. So if it's going to be tectonic forces, if it's going to do anything that's, that will, uh, will, will cause something like this. So at some point in the past when the moon was volcanically active, I shouldn't, actually I shouldn't say tectonic forces either because the moon doesn't have continental plates. So, um, but yeah, back when the moon was more geologically active, about three billion years ago, is is when a feature like this could have formed. It's not, you know, it looks like well, maybe a meteorite came in and hit it at a shallow angle. Well, we've done experiments with aiming meteorites into some type of material or a projectile into material, and as long as the angle is above um, five degrees, I mean, a very shallow angle of only five degrees or higher will produce a round crater. Right. So um, so even shallower than that, I mean, you might get an ellipsoidal crater. You wouldn't get a feature like this. This is some sort of rifting, uh, something left over from, from volcanic processes on, on the moon. So. Right, like some kind of like cracking, like some of the features. There's features like this on Mercury, right, where you've got right. these these situations where the the surface of mercury has cooled and cracked and you and you get these spider web shapes around some of these craters so right these, these features called scarps where essentially yeah. as the crust cooled it's like if you if you take a cake and you you let it cool too quickly the cake starts to sink um, this essentially happened on mercury except now you're dealing with molten rock instead of cake batter and you get places where the, the crust just shifts and you end up with this very high cliff wall on on one side called a scarp now this isn't this isn't a scarp the moon does have scarps as well um, they'd be farther to the south and at least slightly east of this on the moon um, so I mean the moon does have some of these features uh, as well, but this is uh, yeah, this is just a, a valley in the, the the Apennines on the moon. So BTL seven forty three notes that you have rave reviews on Rate My Professor, Dad. Four point nine <laughs> overall. Thank you um, to <laughs> all my students who enjoyed having me for class. I just I don't know, I do what I do. I it's, I tell my students you know basically I get paid to tell you stuff I would tell you anyway. I mean here I am. Tonight, <laughs> so, here you are tonight telling yeah, people. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's it's a good life. I can't I can't uh, I can't knock it. We'll and give you rave reviews on the virtual star party too. So, <laughs> um, uh, so Phil Mowat asks: Do any of the planets or moons other than the Earth have plate tectonics? Let's see. So plate tectonics, it's tricky. I mean, the thing is with with Earth, as you go through the crust and into the mantle, there is a layer. Under in, in between called the asthenosphere, and asthenosphere means without strength. And so you have the solid uh, plates in the crust and this slightly plastic region underneath on which the continental plates float. So it's denser than the crustal material, but because of the temperature and composition profile of the Earth, 
the continental plates essentially float on this this more plastic area called the uh, the asthenosphere, and so some of it has to do with you know temperatures and consistency of the Earth's surface. Venus could very likely have something like tectonic plates, except that the material at the surface is so hot that it's weak, and if you try pushing on it, it just crumbles. So you don't get plates on something like Venus, Mars, and Mercury. The interiors have gone pretty much cold because they're much smaller. Um, would they have had tectonic activity in the past? I'm not sure if there's there's well, very good uh, very good evidence for it. Now I know so. that one of the problems with Venus is that its plate tectonics shut down. That you know normally you get this this cycle, right? Part of the carbon cycle is that the the Earth, for example, is constantly taking carbon and sequestering it inside the inside the planet. But in but on Venus, the the plate tectonics billions of years ago shut down. And so you're not getting the sequestration of the carbon, and so it's just ending up in the in the atmosphere. Right. I'm not even sure if it was billions of years ago. I mean, there was a massive resurfacing event on Venus. It's estimated to have been between 500 million and 750 million years ago, where 90% of the planet's surface uh, became essentially molten and changed at that time. And that's the kind of event, if that happened on Earth, the amount of gases and whatnot that would be released from that would, I mean, you want to talk about climate change. That <laughs> yeah. Wow. Would be a nasty and massive climate change. I mean, we, if we look at uh, there was a mass extinction about 250 million years ago, if I remember correctly, where large portions of the Earth's crust were ripping open, and you had enormous amounts of volcanic activity, enormous amounts of sulfur dioxide, and these other gases escaping. So, and that was you know roughly an area. I think it was like 20, 10 to 20 percent of the Earth's crust was kind of ripped open in volcanic activity. Um, at that time, so ninety percent. That yeah. is, uh, yeah, yeah, you don't be around for that. <laughs> and then I know that, uh, for example, on for Mars, astronomers, uh, planetary scientists are still kind of arguing about whether or not there is any active uh, volcanism on on Mars, because things like uh, Olympus Mons could be active as recently as even a few tens of millions of years ago. So, you know. There could still be eruptions happening on Mars, but it's definitely not, you're not getting plate tectonics. Right, and the good evidence for no plate tectonics on Mars is the size of Olympus Mons. If you were to take the island of Hawaii, and instead of it sitting, um, instead of it sitting on a continental plate that moves, so you have the entire Hawaiian island chain stretching from south of the Aleutians and then cutting across to the southeast across the Pacific, where every couple of millions of years a new island starts to be built up as that hot spot shifts. Well, on Mars, there's no plate tectonics. Hotspot didn't shift, and you just build and build and build this giant shield volcano that is Olympus Mons, by far the largest mountain in the solar system. So, yeah, yeah very, very different surface dynamics if you have some place that has uh, plate tectonics versus some place that doesn't. Now, Andrew, is this video or is this live? Yeah, this is from last night. <laughs> this is from last night. This is what we could have seen. This is what you could have seen. Except, uh, I think this was a two times Barlow and three times on tonight, so it would have been a, a slightly bigger view uh, tonight, so it's uh, unfortunate that, uh, hey, I thought I'd show something. We, we're, we're, no, I, it was fantastic that you were able to join us, and it was great to, to show the view that you did. We saw it. We saw it. I think I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it confirmed. We saw Saturn. So the, si the Saturn season has officially begun here on the Virtual Star Party. Now, when are we going to get Saturn actually in our, in our night sky? Starting probably late April, early May. Yeah. Um, it'll be, I mean, when I was out in Joshua Tree last weekend, we, we did see it rising at about 12.30 to 1 a.m. or so. So subtract two hours from that for every month. Right now it's mid-February, so it would be about 10.30 for uh, mid-March and then <clears throat> on the, uh, and then um, about 8.30, oh, except there's daylight savings time, so about 9, 9.30 uh, PM mid April. So for putting it in um, star party times, well, East Coast people will start picking it up uh, mid April, and then West Coast people probably by easily by mid May. Yeah. So. Well, I think we're we're sort of nearing closing in on an hour now. So why don't we start to to wrap things up? Um, I'm gonna sort of pass through uh, along here. So Andrew, thank you very much for for joining us, and and thanks for giving us that sneak preview of of Saturn. That was fantastic. 
I know, I know you feel disappointed, but trust me, I, it was great to see Saturn. And I think we need to build up to it anyway, so I'm not that worried. You know, we can have this, this kind of cloudy, hazy view the, the first week, and then next week, we'll, you know, it'll be even better. And then come April, April, May, we'll have, have lots of telescopes, you know, showing a really great view of it. So, no, this was fantastic. Thank you very much. And, David, thanks for bringing the X. <laughs> Lunar X. Lunar X. Yeah, we snickety, saw it. Snickety. Yeah, I think that's the second time we've done it. We've, we've had the Lunar X twice now. Yeah, that was fantastic. All right, and John, thanks for thanks for bringing that view of the moon. That is that is phenomenal. Really like it. Always a blast. Thanks. Oh, fantastic. And Lewis, thanks for your supernova discoveries. <laughs> sure, Dr. Frazier. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and uh, and. Doctor Four Point Nine on Rate My Professor Thad Zabo. Thanks a lot for uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Okay, sure, no problem. I'll see you uh, maybe at. Uh, let's see, we've got the the Astronomy we're Cast gonna, tomorrow. Yeah, we're got Astronomy Cast. So so we're going to be doing our uh, live episode of Astronomy Cast tomorrow. That's going to be at noon Pacific, and the topic is uh, shockwaves. So we thought we would do something that's kind of related. Well, we thought we'd do something that was related to the uh, to the meteor. So yeah, we're doing shockwaves. And, uh, and then I think we've got the education uh, hour on Wednesday. We've got the, uh, uh, the weekly space hangout on Friday. So awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thanks for watching. Uh, sorry we kind of had mediocre weather and, uh, and some broken telescopes tonight. <laughs> I hope Gary's telescope is all right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with him and see how everything's doing. So, so thanks for watching. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you all next week. All right.